Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's an honor and I always enjoy interacting with people doing research work because it's it's really important to advance our engineering methodology. So, so it's always great to be part of anything to do with research. Um, yeah, when Rufu approached me, he asked me, you know, uh, you know, what I'd like to talk about. And the two areas that I work in, in my career mainly, which is in tailings and slurry pipeline design. And I thought, you know, tailings has got a lot of publicity recently and maybe slurry pipeline uh, design or, or technology is maybe not, doesn't have quite the publicity. And I thought this might be of interest to the, um, to your, your, your mining seminar group. So here's a, you know, an overview. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction um, and a short safety share. Talk a little bit about the purpose of how I've structured this presentation and um, and what it what it has. I'll talk in, in in a general sense about the components of of slurry systems, just you know to give some context of, of what we we're dealing with. Um, I'm going to in a very make a very light dip into into the world of rheology, um, and I'm also going to leave you with a new term, which is rheomalaxis. So that's going to be your takeaway from, from this session. And then uh, really just going through some slurry transport applications as related to mining. And this is really just a whole lot of photographs showing how, how slurry transport is used in, in various aspects of mining. Um, then, I, you know, from, from a sort of historical context is look, look at the uh, development of long distance uh, slurry pipeline technology in the US and, and what led to it, it being limited in application. Um, and then to, to sort of round it off, I've just got some tables which just show, you know, some of the major long distance slurry pipelines in the world, just so that you, uh, the people who are participating in this are aware that it is a technology that has, has wide usage. Um, Muthu has already done an introduction for me. Um, I see I'm clean shaven in the photograph. My wife decided that I, on November the 1st, I should join Movember this year. So I've got the beginnings of a, a moustache or goatee at the moment. Um, the, the, um, on the left-hand side is you know, a little bit about our company. Uh, we started in, in South Africa in 91. Um, I moved to the US in 2007 and, you know, been instrumental in the, in the establishment of our offices in, in the US, which is in, in the Denver area, more specifically in Golden. And we have three offices in Canada. We're, we're an employee company with about 160 staff members and, and we provide specialist engineering services to the mining industry. The map, the black areas show where we located in Chile and South America, the US and Canada, South Africa, the UK and, and Australia. Just a you know, safety share on pipelines is, is maybe a reminder that um, even when pipelines are not operated, um, they contain stored en energy. And um, so if you are working on any piping system, you know, take care to make sure it's depressurized and there are met methods and procedures that you need to go through for that before doing any work on it. It's uh, sometimes uh, there have been instances where people have not respected the energy stored in pipeline systems and sometimes the energies are, are substantial, sometimes the compressed gas is involved as well and so, so the amount of energy stored is, is can result in, in, in injuries if you, if you don't and uh, respect it and deal with it in the, in the right, uh, using the right procedures. Um, the presentation purpose, um, I've got some photographs here of our staff members working on various uh, projects. Um, and the, the one thing that I, I noticed that they're all smiling and they're all happy because, you know, working in the mining industry is a, is a great industry to work in because there, there are always so many challenges. There's so many interesting problems to, to be solved and it's, it's so satisfying when you solve the problems. Um, and, and so, you know, I've really geared this um, presentation to graduate students, you know, at, at this Colorado School of Mines. And, and it's, it's really an introduction so that as you, you know, go out into your mining careers, and, and I guess very few of you would become, uh, go specifically into slurry pipeline design, but just as you go into your careers is that you have an awareness of this technology and, and how it could be used in, in mining, because it, it really has a, 
has a very widespread application. So that's that's the the purpose and also hence the content of the presentation. It's it's not it's not a heavily technical presentation. It's it's more a slideshow or a tour through the applications of, of slurry transport with a little bit of rheology and a little bit of history in, in terms of the pipelines in the US. This slide here you know, looks, looks at the, um, the components of, of a slurry system. So if we, if we look at the yellow block, a, as we start, we, we, the first component is there has to be a tank because you know, we, we've got a, a, a slurry is a you know, solid liquid mixture um, and, and we need to, to, to put it in a tank and, 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 and we also need to think about, do we need to agitate it? Do we need to provide energy to keep the material in suspension? But the next, the very next thing after that is, and, and well, the tank also provides the right suction conditions and also helps um, make sure that we don't have too much gas or air going into the pumping system and the pipeline system downstream. So then the energy source, um, many systems, uh, and certainly historically, most slurry systems were simply um, in flumes or open launders, and so they made use of gravity for transport. Um, and this, this continues today. There, there are many, many gravity systems that in, in Arizona and in, 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 in Chile and Peru, uh, most notably have many systems that are operated purely by gravity. Uh, if you go to pumps, we could use centrifugal pumps. And if we need higher pressure applications, we could also go to positive displacement pumps. And then the transport, it could either be in a, in a pressure, pressurized pipe, it, it could also be in a launder. So when, when we talk about launder flow, it's, it's, it's a flow that has a free surface. And the, and the launder flow could either be in a, in a channel with an open top, or it could be in a pipe which is operated partially full. Um, we also got to think about the pipe materials. Typically it's, it's carbon steel that may be lined or unlined. And where pressures permit, we generally use high density polyethylene. Um, pipeline also needs to think about whether it's going to be buried or above ground. Um, and mostly um, when we are dealing with uh, pipelines that go off, off the owner's property or onto third party property, uh, then, then the pipeline is buried. And if it's on the owner's property, typically it is a, an above ground pipeline. Again, the considerations if it's a long pipeline, a short pipeline play into the design and, and really importantly is the topography. How much elevation changes, how many valleys do we need to go through that has an impact on, on how you approach the design. Uh, some systems require a, um, a additional energy to be added in through a booster station and there's maybe a consideration whether you pump directly into the booster pumps or whether you, uh, which would be called a tight line configuration whether you put another tank here and then and then start pumping again and, and essentially have two separate uh, operating systems, you know, hydraulically independent systems. Uh, many cases, particularly in mountainous areas, we, we have an excess of energy available in some locations and so we may need to, to dis dissipate that, that energy. So this slide is sort of you know got, got the key sort of um, uh, components that we need to consider. And if we go into the design, we look at all the tonnages um, and then also you know, the slurry properties. And we're gonna get onto this just a little bit looking at, at uh, rheology in, in, a very, in a very light sense. So here's rheology. So I've, I've got rheology in three, and then I've added one other slide, which is the rhea malaxis slide. So here's a lesson of rheology in, in, in four slides. And I think for most engineers, it's probably all you need to know. Um, so uh, if you listen up here now through these four slides, you can relax for the rest of the presentation. So, so the strict um, definition of rheology is the science, you know, dealing with flow and deformation of matter. And we, for, for our purposes in, in, in terms of slurry pipeline transport, we consider it to be the viscous characteristics of a fluid or a, or a homogeneous solid liquid mixture, solid liquid mixture being, being a, a, a slurry. So these photographs here just show this is honey, this is you know, uh, lava from a volcano, and, and at the bottom it's, it's tailings flow. And these, these photographs here show the characteristic by what we mean by viscous, because it is important that when we talk about um, rheology, we're talking about flow, flow behavior that is, is dominated by the viscous characteristics. 
And if we look at the two videos on, 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 on the right hand side in black there, the top shows flow which remains laminar. And, and in laminar flow, we, we're considering that the flow lines remain parallel to each other. So the, the viscosity or the viscous forces dominate the flow behavior. But below that, we've got the flow going at a higher velocity and it's, tr it's, it's transitioned into turbulent flow where the inertial forces now dominate the behavior of, of the mixture. Now, now for most slurry systems we deal with, we're dealing with turbulent flow and the turbulent flow is, is essential for ensuring particle suspension. So it's a key characteristic of most conventional slurry flows. And now there are some cases that deviate from that, but probably 90% of the cases that you would come across are, are turbulent flows. Now it's, you can measure the laminar flow characteristics and then predict the turbulent flow behavior. And that's why rheology is important. You, you cannot do an experiment and measure the turbulent flow behavior and use that to predict the rheology or the viscous characteristics. It's, a, it's a, like a one way. So, so mostly what we're doing is we're trying to characterize the viscous behavior of the material, i.e. it's when it's in laminar flow, and we're using that then to predict its behavior in, in turbulent flow. So a way to think of rheology is, you know, going back to, to sort, of, sort of, you know, solid behavior. So in the top here, we have a steel bar, say, that's embedded in a, in a, in a concrete wall. And we apply a force to it. And if we, any force we apply actually stretch, stretches that bar, if its initial length is L. If you um, uh, apply a force, you're going to stretch it slightly, say DL. And the amount that you stretch the bar is directly proportional to the force that you apply to the bar. And we can see this plotted as Hooke's law. So we, we take the stress, which is the force divided by the cross-sectional area of the bar, and we plot it against the strain rate, which is DL over L. And if we do that in the elastic range, we see that we get a linear behavior, which is known as Hooke, Hooke's law. And the slope of that line is the elastic modulus of, of the material, the steel material, for instance, that we're considering. Now, the analogy with fluids is, is, is very similar, but in this case, we consider that we have two uh, large plates, infinitely large in, in, in the concept, uh, that are separated by a, a small distance, and we have um, fluid between the two plates. The bottom plate is kept stationary, and then a force is applied to the top plate, which causes it to start moving. And we end, we end up with a plot, which is very similar. So we plot here shear stress, which is the force that's applied to the top plate, divided by the area of the plate, against the shear, shear rate, which is the velocity of the top plate, say in meters per second, divided by the gap between the two plates, which would also be in meters. So you've got meters per second divided by meters, and you end up with a unit of one over seconds or often referred to as reciprocal seconds, and that's the shear rate. Okay. So if you have a Newtonian fluid, you would also get a, a, a straight line as long as you remain in that area that's dominated by the viscous characteristics. If you go into turbulent flow, it, there's a deviation. Uh, and the slope of that line is, is the viscosity. So there, there's a direct analogy between the elastic behavior of solids and, 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 and Newtonian uh, rheology or viscosity. So, so the third um, item to know about rheology, that rheology is just really fitting curves. Okay. Um, so on, on the left-hand side, we've got this plot of shear stress versus shear rate, as I described before. And you do an experiment and, and you know, admittedly, there's some, some work to be done into figuring out how you get that parallel plate into a reasonable configuration to do an experiment. But that's, you know, that's an area of rheology measurement, which I'm, I'm not going to go into. But if, if you plot a series of data from your experiment, and then you fit a line to it, um, the, the, in, in this case, we have a Newtonian mater material because it starts at the origin, and we, we are able to fit a straight line to it. So we can say the slope of that line is the viscosity. So the shear stress 
is related to the shear rate by a, a single parameter, which is, is the viscosity. So this plot of shear stress versus shear rate is called a rheogram or, or a flow curve. Now, if you take a, um, a material, another, you do another experiment with another material, and you find that in this case, you're not able to fit a straight line that starts at the origin, then that means that that material is not non-Newtonian. And now there are a whole lot of different models or rheological models, or sometimes called rhe rheological characterizations of this data. But I think the important thing to remember is all that is being done here is fitting a curve to a set of data points that are measured for a laminar flow or, or flow that is dominated by, by the viscous characteristics of the material. Um, this, this offset that we have here from, from on, on the, on the uh, y-axis at, at zero shear rate, that, that shows or indicates that you need to apply some force uh, before the material moves. So you start applying some force or pressure differential and you don't get, get any, any um, uh, uh, shear, shear happening and then you, you exceed a certain shear stress and then the material starts to flow. And so that this intercept here is called the yield stress and, and is often used in, 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 in the design of these systems. It's a, and it's a parameter that's often used to describe um, the characteristics of a material. Mostly for engineers um, who are practicing engineers, not doing research, we don't like to have more than, we, we would prefer everything to be one parameter so when we, so mostly our models that we use, we accept a yield stress, but most of the fluids, thankfully in mining, can be fitted by a straight line to that. So you have a yield stress and then a, a parameter, which is called the plastic viscosity that defines the slope of the, um, of, of, of the rheogram. So here's the, the take home word from, from this presentation, which is rheomalaxis. And if you take a, a material like this shown, shown on the left-hand side, this is a sort of a standard slump test um, where you fill this cylinder with the material and then you lift it and you see its behavior. In this, in this case, you can see when it's lifted that there's a pile of material there. It, there's a pile of material because that material has a yield stress. You can imagine that if you fill this um, a, a slump a cylinder with, with uh, water, and you lifted it up, it would just flow away because water does not have a yield stress. Um, but if you take the same material and you subject it to some agitation uh, and you re repeat the test, you'll see the, you'll get the result that's shown on the, on the right hand side. Uh, um, where, where you can see that there's been a substantial reduction in the yield stress, okay. And, and, and the one way you can do this experiment is, is to measure uh, to have a, a constant shear rate and measure sh shear stress as a function of time. And what you would see is that you get a, a reduction in, 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 in shear stress, okay? And, and that's shown visually by the photographs on the left and the right. So, so rheomalaxis is an irreversible decay in shear stress of shearing duration. Now in these materials that are, or the material that's shown here, this is um, material that comes out the bottom of a thickener it has been, it been flocculated and, and the, and the flock, flocculant helps create a sort of an aggregate structure which traps within it a lot of liquid. And so when you subject that to shearing, you break up those structures and, and you free up the liquid or the water phase and, and you're able to get this um, reduction in rheology. And this is very common in, in say thick and tailings. Uh, in, in some of the materials that we, we work with, if, if you actually do, do this and, and you leave it in a quiescent state for a period of time, there will uh, potentially be some recovery of, of, of yield stress um, you know, with, with time. But you know, mostly for the materials that we're talking about, this, this uh, decay of, in shear stress happens in, in the, within the, the um, time scale of what we're dealing with, say during the pump pipelining, you know, while you're pipelining it, which may only be you know, from minutes to hours. So it's a fairly short time. So we don't see the recovery. So in, in, for practical pur purposes, most of our materials, we can consider them to be irreversible within the time scale that we're dealing with. So that's the word. And I'd like you to practice it on one of your colleagues tomorrow, try and bring it up in a conversation somehow. All right, 
so, so now you can relax. It's not, now it's all just easy, just looking at photographs. Um, so one of the professors at the School of Mines told me this, and, and I've, I've forgotten his name. I'm, I'm really embarrassed and I need to, need to find out his name and maybe you can help me. Um, but I like to use this quotation because I'm involved in transportation and this, this brings it close to my heart. Yeah, mining is about moving materials, but, but, but it really is. You know, if you think about it, it's very often, you know, you've got to mine and before you can even start mining, you've, you've got to remove overburden or waste. You know, so there's, there's going to be a waste dump. So there's always, you know, a material, even, even with underground mining, there's development waste. There's always material that has to be moved out of the way before you can get access to the ore body. Uh, within, the, it, within the mining process itself, we, we can find applications of slurry transport. Uh, but once you've, you've, you've got hold of the ore, it's got to be transported to a concentrator. And there's a whole lot of transport processes that happen within the concentrator. Um, the goal of the concentrator is to produce concentrate, which again needs to be transported. Um, the concentrator also generates tailings, which needs to be transported to, to a storage location. And in, in most modern mining or many uh, applications of modern underground mining, part of the tailings is also used as backfill in, in, in the mine as well. And that backfill has to be then transported back, back into the mine. So here's, here's some photographs. This, this is a project I worked on fairly early in my career. This, this is in, in Namibia, it's on, on the you know, Western um, side of Southern Africa. Um, and, and this was using a, um, a, a dredge to remove overburden material uh, and, and mainly sands uh, from uh, above uh, concentrated uh, diamond bearing gravels. So, so the whole project here was just to remove overburden material. Um, but because this whole, and so they flooded this whole area with seawater to allow this to happen and, and they could float this, this dredge here. But because this process was so cost effective, they were also able to put in a, a floating treatment plant. And so the overburden material that they dredged was actually processed and they recovered enough value in the diamonds there to pay for the overburden removal process. So a very effective way of, of moving materials. Um, you know, the hydraulic sort of monitoring or, or of, of, of um, um, all bodies or, or tailings, uh, you know, historical tailings deposits is also used. You know, the photograph on the top left here is in, in California, where a lot of the mining, early mining operations were done by monitoring the ore bodies and, and, and getting the, the slurry to flow in, 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 in streams through to their processing facilities. The other two photographs here are shown where historic um, gold tailings dumps are being reprocessed and they're using um, hydraulic monitoring to, to um, slurryfy and, and get the material through to, to the concentrator. The photograph on the right is in, in North Carolina, you know, potash operation. And this, this is interesting because they, they're using a big drag line to move material to a point where they're, they're actually sort of monitoring it and they have a pumping system there as well. And this is then pumped to a processing facility from there as well. But uh, so maybe not directly at the face of the mining, but certainly as soon as the material is mined, it, it, it is transported. Uh, applications of, of dredging, uh, you know, which is widely used in mining. This, I, I put this photograph up here of one in Fairplay here in Colorado, you know, historic one. This strictly is not quite um, uh, slurry transport because they're sort of mechanically excavating the material and mechanically discharging out the other end. But this is an early sort of dredge type type configuration. On the right hand side is, is, is a more modern um, sort of uh, dredging application. This is in, in Mozambique, um, eastern side of southern, southern Africa, where they are um, mining mineral sands that are, uh, have been concentrated in, in sand dunes. And, and, and again, by creating these ponds where you can float in dredges, and in this case as well, the, tr the treatment plant is also uh, um, floating. It's a very cost-effective way um, of, of mining. And the, the, there are a number of applications of, of marine mining, so mining below the, 
the ocean. On the left-hand side are, are some photographs of um, typical configurations that are used um, off the coast of Namibia in South Africa, uh, where um, diamond bearing material is, is, is essentially dredged from the ocean floor. Typically the depth's about 100 meters, maybe up to 200 at the deepest, so not very deep, um, but still it's, it's, a, it's a, a cost effective way of, of doing it. The material that is dredged is, is then processed on the ship, right? So, so and in, in these cases, the, the, the concentrate, the diamonds that they, they try to, to recover, um, are actually flown off the ship using a helicopter, right? Because it's a very small amount um, that, that is, forms the concentrate. On the, on the right hand side, this is a graphic from, from uh, Deep Green um, who are looking at um, mining not nodules on the sea floor. It's manganese, but other sort of rare earth um, uh, materials as well. A lot of it in demand for, for making batteries. And, and here, they, here they're talking in this, this uh, diagram here, they're showing four to four and a half thousand meters. You know, I know of applications where they're looking at this up to 5,000 meters. So this, this is where, where um, you, you're mining at, at considerable depth. And uh, you know, really the challenges of getting um, remotely operated machines to operate on the sea floor for the mining activities are, is probably equally complex or maybe more complex due to the high pressures involved than, than you know, say sending something to the moon. Uh, so this, this is a, a form of mining that is, has been done at small scale but it's very likely that in the next decade, we're going to see multiple um, commercial operations like, like, like this. And, and I'm sort of peripherally involved in, in a project that is looking at aspects of, 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 of this technology. Uh, another form of air, air trans or transport, and I noticed that Dr. Reed is, is uh, attending, um, is, is, is in the oil sands industry in, in Canada where initially the ore was transported from the, the mining area to the processing facilities using conveyor belts. But over time, the, the technology of hydro transport was developed. So the ore is, is mixed with hot water. So this is you know, bitumen, um, some clays and sand and, and rocks uh, and mixed together and then pumped uh, to, to, the, um, um, to the processing facility. And in, in this photograph, we can see two ore pipelines come in and there's two primary separation vessels. And, and one of the, the, the real benefits of this, you know, not only in terms of being a cost-effective transportation method, is but that you start to get some, some um, pre-processing of, of the oil sand ore in the pipelines. So we start to get some separation of the bitumen from, from the sand fraction during, during pipeline transport. So, and, and there are other uh, examples of this is where some of the processing is done in the pipeline as well, not, not just in a reactor downstream. So, so that's an interesting application. And, and this method is used uh, almost exclusively for the oil sand mining operations now. They, they no longer rely on conveyor belt technology. The, another method of ore transport is to, for underground mines is to pump the ore from, from underground to, to surface. And they have been a, a number of historic, um, you know, applications. I'm, I'm actually not aware of one that is operating right now. There is a uranium operation in, in Canada, which I believe is on care and maintenance right now, but they did this for quite a long time, is, is to, to pump the ore from underground um, to surface, again, using slurry pipeline technology. And the photograph on, on the, on the um, right-hand side is, is Anglo-Americans Las Bronces operation in Chile, where um, the uh, at the mine site, which is at high elevation, the ore is crushed and ground to size and then transported through a, it's longer than 50 kilometers, I think it's 54 kilometer slurry pipeline, I think it's 24 inch, uh, to, the, to the flotation circuit, which is located us at Las Tortolas, uh, which is close, at, right, right at the tailings facility. So here's an example of um, the high elevation of where the ore body is was not well suited for, for, for the total concentrated, more specifically the, the flotation circuit. So the ore is ground and then transported a considerable distance to a location which is more uh, better suited for tailing storage and also for the flotation circuit. Um, within any, any process plants, 
there are many, many applications of slurry transport. It's, it's, it's you know, nearly all um, the extractive circuits that we employ in the mining industry are water-based. Um, and, and so the method of transporting materials from one point to another invariably involves um, either pumping or you know, where gravity permits uh, is making use of um, you know, gravity to drive, the, um, to drive the flow. You can see these, these are um, you know, a bank of flotation cells at um, Cerro Verde in Peru. And, and you can see that they stacked at a slight elevation. So they are getting slurry transport from one tank to the other, but they're making use of, of gravity to do so. Again, a, a very, very common, common arrangement. Uh, tailings, um, you, you know, at the end of the mine operator, or after you've extracted the, um, the metal that you're after, then the tailings needs to be transported. And so there's another transport there. Uh, most of the um, modern systems are thickening the tailings to, to a consistency that would be non-Newtonian. In other words, it would have a yield stress. And so the uh, interest in, in pumping that and, and, and designing those systems is, 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 of, um, is a challenge. And, and again, something that uh, is, is, uh, has changed over time because initially it was very dilute and very easy to do. And now, now it requires a little bit more expertise than it did previously. Mine backfill. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful that I'm a little going a little slow here, so I'm going to go slightly quicker through these slides. Mine backfill. This is for, for people involved in mining. In many cases, using backfill to, to provide um, you know, support and, and improve the extraction rates from the ore bodies is, is it's integral with modern mining. So so here we we're taking tailings. We we. Be concentrating it so that it's 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 sort of um, almost at the same consistency as, as say concrete. Adding adding a binder, you know, cementitious material to it, and then pumping it underground to fill those the, the mined out voids or the stopes. Uh, concentrate transport. I'm I'm going to come back to this a little bit, but th this this is the, the many applications of where the concentrate or the product is transported um, over a considerable distance. Uh, from, from the mining site to where it's exported. The top photograph here is, is the Ramu nickel laterite pipeline in, in, in Indonesia that we worked on. And the bottom right here is, is in Morocco. It's a 36 inch, uh, 87 kilometer uh, phosphate pipeline, uh, which is also exporting all, uh, sorry, a concentrate to, to a processing facility. So I think it's just, it's, it's quite interesting to look at what happened with long distance slurry pipeline transport in the US. Um, you know, the first pipe, uh, slurry, slurry pipeline system of any uh, significant length was the consolidated coal slurry pipeline. Um, and it, it was um, you know, built in a, a higher and it transported coal slurry from uh, a, ore prepar a coal preparation plant, Cadiz, through to a, a, um, a power station, which was on Lake Erie. Uh, it, it, was, it was 110 um, kilometers, uh, sorry, 110 miles. It was a 10 inch pipe and it transported one and a half million tons of coal per year. Um, it operated, you know, it, it was designed in the 50s and it operated from 1957 to 64. Effectively, it was about six years, years of operation. And, and this pipeline was put in because the People who controlled the railways in this area were charging an exorbitant fee to transport coal uh, to, to the power station. So this was put in specifically to compete with rail transport. And, and once this was, was put in and, and demonstrated to be successful, the, um, the railways then reduced their tariffs considerably, about a 50% reduction so that it was more cost effective to use the railways and then the system was put it put in and in, 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 was mothballed and, and no longer used so the in, in one way to look at this it, it was a successful demonstration of the technology and it helped these people reduce their rail tariff but it really set up the battle between rail and, and, and pipelines in, in, in the us um, 
so, so there was a lot of lobbying and a lot, lot of politics around this and trying to convince people that um, slurry pipelines offered a, an economic and a safer method of transporting coal within the US. And, and they were really up against the railroads, which were uh, you know, extremely powerful because the, the railroad companies had really developed the, you know, the, the US as, as a move from, from east to west all the development in the country followed the development of the rail railway line. So they extremely powerful group. But here's a quotation from, you know, President Kennedy in 1962. And, you know, he was saying then is we cannot permit railroads to prevent coal slurry pipelines from conveying the resources of our mines, right? So he was getting involved in, in this debate. So, so the, the result of this was the you know, one, one successful construction is Black Mesa Coal Slurry Pipeline in, in, in Arizona, which um, transported coal, um, you know, 273 miles. There, were, there, were, um, there was one main pump station and another three um, booster st stations, and they transported to the Mojave uh, Power Plant, which is, you know, I think that's, it was located in, in Nevada, just close to, to, to California. Obviously, California was probably the consumer of all, all the power that was, was being generated. Um, this system, um, it operated, you know, it's an 18 inch pipeline. You know, it's a long pipeline, 273 miles. It operated successfully, you know, it's, it's, it's design life essentially, what it was designed from, from, from 1970 to, to 2007. Um, an amazing thing is, you know, it, it transported nearly 5 million tons of coal per year, and, and it only employed 57 people, and, and it, it achieved over its lifetime a 99% availability. So, you know, really a, a, a completely successful demonstration of how useful this technology is. Um, but nevertheless, you know, this, this, this battle continued. Um, you know, here's a quotation from President Carter in 1977. Again, related to this, that we need more competition. Uh, this this drawing here shows you know all the pipelines that were conceived. Here's the Black Mesa pipeline shown here, but there were many others that were in the, in the planning stage, including one from you know Walsenburg in southern Colorado that was going to take um, a coal down to a, a power plant in in Texas. Um, but the main the main drive was um, the uh, from, from the Powder River Basin in, in, in Wyoming. And, and there was this, this Etsy pipeline system here. It was, it was 1,300 miles long. It's going to be a 48-inch pipeline. And it was going to transport, you know, um, I, don't, I forget the numbers, but pro probably in the order of 20 to 30 million tons an, a year of, of coal uh, down, down to Louisiana. Right? So this was, was going to be a major system. They also had some systems going from, from um, Wyoming heading eastwards as well. So this w w was, was the plans and the railways, they, they got um, you know, Congress to, to you know, eventually stop this by passing the pipeline eminent domain bill. And, and really what this, the, the nuts and bolts of this it was it prevented a slurry pipeline from ever crossing a ra railway line. And, and, and that because of the rail network it was simply impossible to find a pipeline route that did not do that. And, and that really spelled the end of um, coal pipeline transport technology in the US. And, and, and effectively, any, any slurry pipeline technology has not been implemented widely in the US since that. Um, so this, this, this ruling was in, in 1982. But I, I've, I've put this table here just so that you, you're aware that, in fact, there are many other long distance slurry pipelines that have been built in the, in the world. And just looking at a few on this table here, the first one was the consolidation coal one that we discussed. Then there was you know, one in rugby in, in England, which I believe is still operating. So, so it has performed very well. It's, it's, it's a uh, you know, 92 kilometer pipeline, you know, roughly 60 miles. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a good length. It's not a big pipe, it's also 10 inch. The next major pipeline was, was built in, in Tasmania, you know, transporting iron concentrate. And it's called you know, the Savage River system. And, and then the, the fourth one is the Black Mesa pipeline, which we also, also discussed. Um, but, so this is one, one table here. You know, this, this is going through uh, another, other pipelines. I'll mention this one, Alambrera, which is in Argentina. 
This is a pipeline system that was, you know, started in 97. It, it operated its design life and the, the Alambrera mine is now exhausted. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that there's a new or, or, or new mine in planning, a new mine project called Aguarica, which is, is adjacent to Alambrera. And, and we're working on bringing the, um, reusing the Alambrera pipeline for the Aguarica project. So that, that pipeline is, is going to be reused. Um, and, and here's the end of the table. I've only put in the major pipeline systems, but the, the final one here is the OCP one, uh, which is a phosphate one in, in Morocco. You see it's a 36 inch um, pipeline transporting 35 million tons per year. Um, and, and this is a photograph at the bottom of that during the, the pipeline pressure testing. So our, our company did the, the detailed engineering of, of, of this project. Um, so that, that brings me to, an end, I think I've met the time constraints and I'd be very happy to take any, any uh, questions or discussion if, if there are any. Awesome, thanks a lot, Dr. Cruz, this is really, this is really in depth, especially the concepts to begin with and then the applications. Um, I would request the participants if you, you can unmute and ask your question. Um, and I would start with A. Robbins. Um, if you cannot, then I can read your question. All right, I go ahead with the Robin's question. So his question is, over the past two years, has there been an increased interest in thickened paste and tailing systems? Yeah, absolutely. That, that interest started about uh, 15, 20 years ago um, and, and, and it continues um, you know, with um, the unfortunate recent uh, tailings facility failures. There's a recognition that uh, having less water in tailings is beneficial. So there's a lot of interest in thickened and paste tailings, but um, perhaps to a certain extent that has been um, maybe taken over by an interest in producing filter tailings, which are drier and, and going to the next step. So, so we'll see how that plays out in the industry. Uh, ben, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cook, for your talk. Uh, my question is, I was curious about what were major sort of industry problems or gripes related to uh, slurry transport. I know you touched on it a bit, but can you expand on it? Um, look, I, I think overall um, pipeline systems, and we, we maybe just thinking about long distance pipeline systems for now, are, are a much safer and in most cases, a more economic method of transporting materials. Um, but they do have some drawbacks. Um, the first is, when you put in a pipeline system, you're putting all that capital into the ground and it's very specific. It, it meets a certain duty and a certain route, right? It can only go from uh, along where you've, you've put the pipeline. We, you know, we're, when you compare that to say rail, rails share some of that and trucks less so, right? Uh, you could move rail cars onto other, other rail track or trucks are, are most easy to move somewhere else. So, so the capital commitment um, is higher than the other transportation systems, um, but the trade-off is the economics over the project life. Uh, I, I get, and, and, and I guess there is the risk always that there's going to be a failure of the pipeline and that there's going to be a spillage. And so, so the design needs to consider that. And um, most modern pipeline systems have advanced leak detection on them so that any, uh, leaks can be detected, even leaks as small as 2% of the mainline flow can be detected relatively quickly within minutes, uh, so within five minutes, and, and, the, and, and the system isolated to minimize the volume of spillage. But that, that risk is always there and, and, and it needs to be accepted and considered during the design phase. Perfect, uh, thank you. Um, we have Kendra, um, do you want to go ahead? The question is, is the table of long distance pipelines available? Is that, that's a question from Kendra. Hi, Kendra. Um, I, I was really enjoyed reading your report that you did recently on, on pipeline technology. I, I think you did a great job on that. Uh, yes, um, I'm, I'm sure we can provide it to, um, in some format. I, I think you do have my, or Stephen Young's email address from our company and, and he'd be able to provide it to you. Um, 
Dr. Nelson, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Hi, Rob. This is Hi. this Hi. is great. Good to see here about the OCP pipeline. And the last time I was over there, I was talking with them about some kind of a hybrid mining method um, as they go after the uh, underground mining of the phosphate ore and they get below the water table. So it's, it's fairly low strength material overall and relatively easy to excavate. But the idea of trying to do some kind of a hydraulic slushing um, long wall operation um, so that you have the collapsed material behind and you could actually make an underground um, natural tunnel openings. So you're not putting the pipes down there, you're, you're making the openings for um, the, op the tunnels to yeah. actually uh, provide the hydraulics. Have you ever heard of anything like that? And do you think that that would work? And should we talk more about that? We should always talk more, Priscilla, because I enjoy <laughs> talking with you so much. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I think so. We could probably look at, you know, the Tronox, Troner operations might, might have something and we can learn some of the solution mining. Um, I might say that it, uh, in, in a friable ore body with a lot of water around, I'm not sure that I'd like to be the miner in that, but... Um, Oh, it's, it's all robotic. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think around a whiteboard, we uh, it's, yeah. When when we can get together again, I think it would be interesting to brainstorm ideas. That's so, great. So, That's good. Certainly, the ideas of, of using um, water jets to, to to do the mining, you know, to yeah. separate it and collect this collect the slurry and transport it has been that. And the uranium operation, you know, they they it's all ro robotic there as well, and that has been operating very successfully. So. I could yeah, show so you I was sort of thinking like instead of doing a shear or having something like a like a, a, a string of in, of trade beads that could actually have an, an excavating an entry material and you could actually just slush it through the internal pipe of that and um, so anyway good we'll do that Rob Thank okay. you. thanks for some of the thanks thanks Dr. Nelson we have uh, two questions from me um, I'd like to read them out. The first one is, could you please list the top three current challenges PNC is facing with the current slurry pipeline projects? Um, I, I guess the first one would be an in investment in mining perhaps is, is you know, there, there, there are a number of slurry pipeline projects that are, are being considered, but um, are not, not move, moving ahead because I, I guess the, Investment environment, there's some uncertainty. So, so I think that that's probably a general answer that co could cover any mining related question. So that's a bit of a cheat. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that, you know, the, the, the one thing that would concern me always on a design is, is, is making suitable provision for how to handle leaks. And yeah, that, that I think is, is, is the main issue that I, I, as a designer, I would be, be, be concerned about. I think the other technologies in, in terms of certainly the pumping equipment has really advanced considerably in the last 20, 30 years. So we have very re reliable pumping systems. So that, that's not, not a concern. And um, perhaps the, the, maybe if you do want a third one is, is, is you know, getting access, permitting, getting permission to, to, to put the pipeline in and getting the right of way, et cetera. That, that's always gonna be a, a challenge. Thank you. Um... So another one from me as well. Is there currently any competitor for slurry pipeline technology like railways uh, in the beginning? What's what's the current uh, competitor for uh, replacement technology? Uh, sorry, Musi, just re repeat. Oh, or what is a competitor for slurry pipeline? You had mentioned railways in the past. Oh. So is there any new modern technology or comparative ones? No, I think I think they remain. Um, you know, for, for, for long distance transport, the the options are conveyor belts, trucks, train, train, or, or, or pipelines. Those those are the options. Thank you. Um, Corey uh, has a question. Do you want to go ahead and ask it? Um, so the question is: um, technology around monitoring, minimizing environmental risk. What have you seen in this space? Well, mostly it's it's a, it's around leak detection because that's the number one number one risk. So so the advanced systems are, are using um, much more sophisticated mass balancing techniques than were previously used. 
We're also using temperature pressure measurements along the pipeline to detect any deviations from normal flow behavior. The pressure, pressure signals are used to uh, track transients and, and, and identify the location of, of where the leak has happened. Um, there are also you know, other technologies which are placed in, in, along the pipeline during construction uh, using fiber optic technology that can detect um, a leak either, either acoustically or through uh, detecting moisture locally as well. So, so that's where, where um, technologies have improved. There's also, you know, well established now is, is um, measuring the wall thickness, the pipe wall thickness uh, online continuously as well. It's also something that has been established in the last, say, five years or so. Thank you. Uh, Robert, uh, how much does it cost per mile, uh, a ton a mile, for a pipeline like going from Escondida to the uh, Antofagasta? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm too experienced to answer that question. I, I, I've, I've learned to be, take care on um, jumping in uh, where angels fear to tread because there are so many variables um, and, and any number would be sort of indicative. So, so you, you know, maybe we can have a discussion afterwards and I can maybe give you some indicative values of projects, but it, it really is, is a function of the, of, of the length to a certain extent, but the topography mainly is, is you know, what, what are the elevation changes and, and also the tonnage because the costs go down with reducing tonnage. So, so it's, it's not really possible to give one answer to that question, I'm afraid. I mean, I gave you the site specific uh, topography. <laughs> yeah, I'm still going to stay away from it. You're not going to get me to buy from them. Uh, all right. I have one you. question. Uh, My name is Nikhil Rao. Uh, I wanted to ask if there's any opportunities for co-mining, like uh, two different minerals side by side, where one helps the other in transport. Mm. Well, uh, there, there has been um, exactly you know, what what you mentioned is is because one of the it, it would be fantastic if you could transport coarse coal to export. Um, and so th there have been a lot of, a number of technologies that have looked at this. Uh, one of them is to use magnetite to form a heavy medium carrier fluid uh, in which you could transport the coarse coal. Now, they have been, that has been explored conceptually. Um, and I, I think there's maybe even been some, some trials on that. Um, but that has not, to my knowledge, been implemented commercially. Now there is, there was um, an application in, in, in Russia where they were transporting coal uh, from Siberia, where they built a pipeline, and it's actually on that table, I think it, it was on the order of 200 kilometers or 200 miles. Um, and they, there they, they had a mixture of fine coal and coarse coal which they believed would be a stabilized mixture and that they could transport at low velocity over long distances. That concept ended up being flawed and that pipeline never operated successfully. So that's, that's a black mark against our industry because it was a big investment that never, never worked. Um, but those, those ideas have been sort of explored, um, but I'm, I'm not aware of any of those going towards implementation. Is, is, is that what you were suggesting, that, that kind of concept? Yes, indeed. Uh, when, when you have settling slurries, a way to make them uh, back non-settling and uh, try to get to your destination. Mm. Was... The, the problem is when, when you're there in a sheared area, um, effectively the yield stress that suspends them when they're quiescent has sort of been overcome and, and they are able to settle in, in, the, in, the, in the sheared zone. Um, there's the Saskatchewan Research Council um, are, have got a program where they are investigating the flow of these, these laminar, um, lamina, laminar flows with, with settling slurries and, and, and trying to understand this better. But this, this is a subject of uh, sort of ongoing investigation at the moment. Thank you. Um, Gerard has a question. You want to go ahead? 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, so Rod Terry here. Sorry, my name comes up as Rod and Maggie as, as my wife. I don't know why my last name's not there. Yeah. So uh, Robert, my, you may be able to answer the question or at least uh, have a valued opinion. As you know, I was the lead engineer on the Torimocho project and we chose Pace Technology for the tailing system um, for Torimocho basically popping up in the high Andes from a high elevation to a much higher elevation. Um, and for a number of reasons, that plant actually doesn't run anywhere near um, uh, paste consistency of material. Now, the reason for having gone that way was part of permitting part of the water balance. Traditional concentrators run, you know, 1 and 1.2, 1.3 cubic meters of water per ton of ore. And Toromocho had the technology work, paste technology, we were going to be in the realms of roughly a little over half a cubic meter per ton of water. So significantly savings. Now, I remember way back when we were first designing and we were looking at the various options, and this goes back, uh, for the rest of the audience, this goes back more than 10 years ago. Um, we had looked at the possibility of filtration and dry stacking. Now, back then, I don't think the technology really made it. We did some, some trade-off studies looking at the cost and operating costs using grasshoppers and stacking conveyors, et cetera. And the cost was actually much more prohibitive than going to the paste uh, tailings technology. But I've noticed out there, there's a lot of filtration companies, Diami filtration, for instance, are touting a two meter by two meter type uh, plate filter and doing very high tonnages. So just a quick question to see, you know, where is this all heading? Um, Toromocha was going to be the single largest paste tailings facility at 117,000 ton per day. Um, never came to that fruition. Um, but we had looked at it more than a decade, looking at the uh, filtration, a dry stacking. This all comes down to water as being our, 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 our resource that we're trying to conserve, which really ties into a lot of permitting for new uh, property. So I just want to see if you what your comments are on that um, going forward, paste technology versus uh, filtering and, and uh, dry stacking. Uh, hi, hi, Roy. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting point that the the whole paste um, technology is, is you know have been it's been really well implemented at small tonnage systems, less less successfully at large tonnage. And, and, and a lot of it is to do with the operating thickness, the paste thickness, big paste thickness at, um, at trying to get it at a high solids concentration. That's always proven to be a problem. And you know, Toromocha is not the only example, you know, Esperanza or Centinella as it's known now, in Chile had experienced very similar, similar operating issues. So I, I think it's, it's, you'd have to say that paste technology at really large tonnages is not properly demonstrated yet. Um, and, and then on the, on the flip side, you know, the filtration technology has been really expensive. But uh, in the last five years, you know, the colossal filter, FLS's colossal filter, when that was introduced, and if you look at what you could buy now, you can buy two filters of the same filtration area, uh, but, you know, that, that are not just recessed chamber filters, but also have a membrane. So, so there's certainly a a reduction in the cost, capital cost associated with, with filtration that's happening. So that may make it more attractive. Um, the studies we've looked at, it might be better to split the tailings. So the coarser fractions filtered and then you maybe deal, do something else with a finer fraction. But I think we're in a, we're in a, a zone now where, we, and, 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 and maybe not a zone, but a point in time where, where it's not clear which is gonna be the winner. Um, Certainly from society or the community's point of view, having a filtered tailings is probably more attractive than having a wet tailings. So we're gonna to have to see, I think in the next five years or so, we'll probably get more directional guidance on this. Uh, Rod, if, if, if I may interrupt, I'm sorry, Rob. Um, Toromocho is a, is a classic case of the desire to make um, proper tailings deposition, but it's all dependent upon the upstream operations of which the people at Toromocho did not manage their uh, mine planning, their ore blending, their crushing, their grinding and sedimentation properly. And uh, unfortunately the uh, tailings operation suffered, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks Corby, that's a, that's a fair point. 
Awesome. Um, I have a couple more questions, but first, since it's already five, I would like to um, conclude the talk and then request Dr. Cook if he can stay for a couple more minutes and answer them. Sure. Um, yeah. um, firstly, uh, thanks a lot for the talk, Dr. Cook. This was really intuitive and uh, thanks for starting with the basics and then going into the applications. It was, it was more comprehensive, touching different aspects. And I'm glad you were able to uh, touch upon a larger audience with, by covering rheology and concepts like that, which is pretty unique uh, and not well known to, though we have been taught in our basics at some point. Um, next, I would like to thank the audience today specifically because we had an attendance of 77 maxing out, which has been a record for us. Uh, I thank uh, uh, SME Latin America branch, which took an initiative to advertise it, and uh, um, colleagues from um, Patterson and Cook of uh, Dr. Robert Cook, who has been very uh, enthusiastic in chatting and LinkedIn and all our LinkedIn uh, followers who have uh, who accepted our invite and are able to join us here. Uh, please uh, follow us for subsequent seminars. Uh, we will keep posting out in LinkedIn. Um, if you want to stay back for uh, a couple more minutes and ask any questions, we'd be happy to have you here. Um, but thanks a lot. A uh, virtual clap for uh, Dr. Cook for his talk. And, uh, <laughs> Hope we can meet sometime with all of you in person and have in-person seminars like this. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mithya. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. All right, I'll ask Ben to go ahead and ask his question first. Sure. Um, thank you. So my question was kind of related to the last two answers that you kind of touched on um, complexities of slurries, such as um, transporting them um, one of the problems is thick slurries is difficult to transport and also sedimentation. I was wondering if you could um, go in depth to give us a little more flavor about the complexities of uh, slurry transport. Yeah. Ben, you're asking a really difficult question. The, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's, um, Yeah, because I'm not sure the the audience's appreciation of all you know all the the issues that are related to to it. Uh, I think uh, yeah, the, maybe I can answer just just in, and I sort of hinted at this earlier. Yeah, just looking at tailing systems, when, when you've got a sort of conventional tailings which is quite a bit, say fifty percent solids or so, really the um, the variation in, in friction loss and deposition velocity between different gold or copper tailings. Uh, is, is, is quite minor. So, so in a way, you could take the one design and, and, and extrapolate it or put it onto, onto another system without, without too much risk of it not working. But as you go to uh, higher solids concentrations, the, the re rheology starts to become much more important. And, and the rheology is, is governed by the, um, the mineralogy of the material. So, so as you go to, to looking at different tailings properties, we're going to find that there's different um, clay mineral species in, 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 the, in the material. We're also going to find that the process waters at different mine sites vary, um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, sodicity, um, uh, the, the pH, et cetera, um, you know, the salinity of the water, all those parameters, and, and they all start to have a very important bearing on, on rheology. And, and so it becomes important that you properly characterize the rheology for the conditions of each site. And, you know, I've, I've got a, a chart, which I obviously can't bring up right now, but shows the variation of rheology of, I think, six or seven copper tailings, uh, which are all very similar at 50%, but are vastly different, you know, orders of magnitude different at, at 65%. And so, so that becomes the, the solution becomes more custom. You need to have a better customized solution or a more specific solution as you go to higher solids concentration. So I hope, I hope that's helpful in, in answering your question there, Tim. Uh, yes, it is. Because I am actually doing a little bit of rheology of just like different variations of bentonite, like just getting them from different companies, you see drastically different rheological properties. So that was kind of the pieces of the question. Yeah, and bentonite's one of the more complex materials, right? And bentonite is going to be very, very uh, pH changes, are, for instance, are going to, going to affect the behavior of, of um, bentonite very much. Okay, thanks, Ben. Ben is a, is a PhD student in uh, chemical engineering. He's been working on biology, so that's why 
he gets okay. he gets more niche in his questions and thanks man for your uh, uh i have one more from steve um he's asking is there a possibility of energy recovery from downhill sections of any of these pipelines yeah that's a great question and and it has been looked at um and they have been experimental um uh, uh pilot configurations bougainville in um in indonesia looked at it it's been looked at in, in Chile. Um, we are more recently, well, recently in the last 10 years or so, looked at it. Um, so this is, the technologies have always been using um, a, a slurry pump or the essential components of a slurry pump as a turbine by getting reverse flow through, through the pump. Um, I, in most cases, the amount of energy that can be recovered is, is fairly minor. But if once you start getting to big pipelines, say Los Bronces, which is a you know, reasonable size pipeline, there may, there may be value in it. Um, and and that, that is still being, being looked at, but it ha we have not got to the point where we can um, commercially implement that yet. Thank you. Um, is there any more questions from the audience? Um, and thanks, Dr. Group, for staying beyond uh, answering them. No worries. Well, Muthu, thank you for the invitation. I've enjoyed uh, virtually meeting your group. And I, as I said, I hope we can do it in person at some point next year. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, hope things turn out for better in 2021. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, glad to have you, Dr. Group. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot to the audience. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to thank everyone for joining as well. Have, have a great day. Thanks. <laughs>